We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This is Cheryl from Jajawarong Country. Hey everyone, we're live. I'm Cheryl Downs, your host today of the Beyond 90 podcast. With me today, I've got Eric and Dale, but we've also got a special guest who we very much hope will be someone who will come back and talk to us again and again. We've got Madge Card for us, uh, talking to us from Queensland, I, I think you're right. So different time zone, same game of footy. Yep, loving it. Loving the Sunshine <laughs> State. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for joining us. How's your week in football been, Eric? Have you been um, up all night watching all sorts of games? Yes, I have. I'm not, sh- I'm not sure how about my retention of said games after midnight, but I mean, I'll try my best with regards to the FAWSL. Yep. And Dale, how about you? Uh, yeah, I I got up, uh, I, well, stayed up and watched the Everton game last night, which was a good result. Um, and... The men's team had a good result as well. So, yeah, I mean, there's been heaps going on this week uh, it, on and yeah. off the pitch. So it's been it's been pretty packed, really. Well, before we get into that big week of football, because that has been a big week in football, but it's not necessarily been a good week in football in, in many ways. I'd love to start off the podcast by a bit of an introduction to Madge to get to know you a little bit um, on and off the scenes of football. We've already compared our outfits today and I can see that you're wearing the, the beautiful dotted um, jersey that represents uh, the French team which is a beautiful top and I'm actually wearing the matching bottoms today not the football shorts themselves but some track pants is my official sportswear today for my day at work uh Madge tell us what was the first international game that ever broke into your mind that you can remember maybe not the first match that you went to or the first match that you watched but what's one that kind of sits there what do, what do they say rent free in your mind yeah yeah oh, first international game you know what? It was actually probably, and I think it was the World Cup in Germany. And it was it, it was because it was a bit of a funny, funny, weird game where there was that insane sort of um, handball. I think it was mm. against Equatorial Guinea. Mm. Yes. So I, I think it, it may have been getting, it must have been getting shown on the ABC. And I'm watching this game and you just see, I think I remember Lena Karmas just seeing the player in the mid, middle of play in front of the goal, just pick up the ball realised the game was still going, dropped it, wasn't called. <laughs> Lena Karmas is like this. Um, and so, you know, you've got to love a bit of, a bit of shenanigans like that. So um, that, that's, that's probably one of the earlier memories of, of um, international football. Different, definitely a different game of football back then, um, just in terms mm. of, well, the world of VAR, mm. uh, the world of, yeah, all, all sorts of things. I, I think football is evolving now into, I don't know whether it or not it's a cleaner game necessarily, but it's a more visible game. And those are some of the things that we'll get into the off off the pitch, Paul Riley kind of incidents that have tarnished, not the game of football so much, but it's, it's made it harder to watch and enjoy when you see and appreciate the things that the players have to go through in, in a league like the NWSL, but they're not the only league. What's your favourite league outside of the W League to watch? Oh, I mean, at the moment, I guess it's the FAWSL. So it's got some of the best players in the world. A lot of the Aussies are playing there. So that's always a really good connection. It gives you a reason to sort of go, oh, the Arsenal game's on. Let's see how Steph Catley's going. Uh, and, you know. So and- are the Gunners the team that you favour? I really don't favour. I'm such a homer. So I, I can't get attached to teams yeah. that aren't. Brisbane pretty much um, and I'm like that in all sports so I kind of just tend to be I just want to see what what are going to, what are going to be the really good matchups and so what looks yep. like it's going to be a really good game to watch so um, so yeah yeah the English league's probably it at the moment okay and tell us about uh, your affiliation with Brisbane and maybe even a bit a bit about Matilda's active support who mm. I think you may have been spied in there once or twice yeah so um I was one of the founding members of the Raw Corps up here in Brisbane. So, uh, yeah, so we founded that in 2017, sort of um, 
got together with Mel Andriata uh, with a, a workshop with women's football fans going, what can we do to support the women's team? And, and active support was one of the big things that came out of that, that meeting that we had out at Ballymore at that time. And then out of that grew the raw core. So a core group of people who decided we're going to get together, we're going to make noise at games, we're going to paint banners. The banners is my thing. So that's um, always love getting different banners up. I'm going to have to paint a fair few new ones this season. Um, yeah, and then so then that sort of evolved uh, as other groups have popped up around the league as well. And, and, and especially, you know, leading into France, uh, Matilda's active support, um, the momentum sort of started building about, you know, generating that sort of active support for the Matildas as well. So I've been involved with that group as well. Yeah. I love a coach. I mean, I love Mel Andrietta, to be honest, but I, I love a coach who brings their own support group. Like how cool. Oh, it was good. She was back. She was facilitating that entire session. So I bet she was. Like, she's like, don't, don't yeah. need a, she got, like a she, cheer she got squad a for our team or something. Yeah. No, she absolutely <laughs> got her teacher skills on and like put us into groups and we had post-it notes and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, she was I here. Promise let, <laughs> I promise I'll let the guys ask some questions as well, but just kind of the last question for me at the moment. In terms of the supporter groups, are there um, differences based on the gender supporter groups? So the gendered supporter groups or maybe for the Socceroos versus the Matildas, not in terms of a a woman supporter of the Socceroos or the, or the Matildas. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Are there different ways that we engage and support our men's team versus our women's team? Yeah, I, I guess from our perspective, it's it's really about a, a positive environment and 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 positive and focusing on really positive support. Um, you know, it doesn't mean we don't mind a little bit of banter. I mean, the Newcastle supporter crew they come up they've come up to Brisbane a few times, and there's always a bit of fun banter when that happens between the two groups. But it's it, it's about it's not making everything really confrontational. It's, a, it's yeah. about having fun, making noise, building atmosphere and showing support. I like it. All right, guys, do you have some questions for Madge before we jump into the hot topics of the week? Anything from you, Eric? Um, just because I know Madge is a little bit across NPL Queensland. Um, Canon Clough, I yeah. think you may have revealed on a Facebook group that you're thinking of a banner for her, which I am all in favour of. And like, I'm just wondering if, with a name like Cannon, she has a really powerful shot, doesn't she? She must. Well, she well, she's more of a fullback, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, she's not she's not always getting up there to score the goals, but it's going to have a cannon. It's got to have a cannon. Yeah. So <laughs> I haven't quite figured it out yet, but um, there will, will absolutely be a cannon in that banner. Is is there like a kind of committee process that goes into banner making? Like obviously you're the one making them, but is there like a is there a committee process that goes into these puns that we love? Oh, uh, look, I, I'm I, I will take ideas, but yeah, it's pretty much me just going, <laughs> and I'll bandy it around the group and go, what about this? What about that? I can't think of a good pun. Is there a better pun? That that sort of idea, but yeah. Mm. People, so there's people who tend to sort of take the lead on the chant writing because they like doing that. So I like doing the design and the banners. So. Um, but yeah, if anyone's got a good idea, um, they they shout it out, and, and we can do that. There's oh a God. guy that we know who's quite good at puns. Dale, do you, do you remember which guy that is? I, you know, is it Eric? Probably Eric. Eric, Eric someone Eric? or other. Yeah, he's well, very I'm glad good you at asked. Ah, uh, Madge. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really you... upset that Caitlin Torpy is gone because Release the Talks was one of my favourite ones from last season. So. Yes. Um, how about Steve McQueen references for Holly McQueen? Well, have you not heard the news? Oh, yep, yep, that's the other one. Yeah, that was the other. Well, Holly, Holly's actually done done her ACL. Oh no! In the Super Cup final last week, so that's mm. really yeah, good one, Eric. Really bad news for Holly. Uh, um, <laughs> so, so no, 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 Steve McQueen. But um, absolutely, I'm sure she'll be back and better and stronger once that's yeah, done. But, yeah, definitely. But, Oh, well, shout out to Holly. We wish you all the very best with your ACL recovery. As we've got Chloe Legazzo is also recovering from an yeah. ACL. And I think just this week, Amel Majri has done her ACL. If I can vaguely translate what um, what was on the French Instagram post or on her Instagram post as well. So best, best wishes and thoughts with her. 
Let's jump into the hot topics of the week and Madge, we want you to be involved in this conversation as well. It's been a really big week in football and I do say that all the time. Usually it's a a lot more positive this time. I, I think it's kind of up and down. But if we start with the first piece of news, which is maybe um, in theory, it's good. We are now the AL dub. There's no more W League. We might call it the ALW. I don't know, but AL dub. We are all the A-Leagues. What are your thoughts on that? And I'll throw straight to you, Madge, um, just to get your thoughts. But in particular, one of the things that I heard, and this is completely unsubstantiated, so one of the things I heard was that APL professional APL leagues actually went out to a couple of the supporter groups to ask them what they thought of it. And I've done a little bit of research and I've only found one so far. So your, your thoughts on, is it good? Is it bad? Is it, you know, half, half, and we can't tell yet. Look, I'm overall, I I think language matters. So I think this is a step in a positive direction around uh, putting all of those the top tier of Australian professional football on, on the same level. Now, I know there's, and, and actually, and going backwards, I actually think whatever way we slice and dice it, there would probably be negatives um, that, that you could pull out of any renaming. Um, so I actually don't mind it. I think A being, uh, I, I know A League being associated with the men's competition and then that we lose the W is is disappointing, and that we lose that W League branding that's been built over over you know more than a decade of, of, of the league. But I think as long as the clubs and the media really follow through on enforcing the A League men's as a title, I think it it really uh, levels out the respect of the the level of the two leagues. Um, but as with anything, I mean, and I also get a little bit tired of the semantics conversations, to be honest. For me, it's really about getting into the nuts and bolts of, of the conditions for the players and, and the fans and, and the product that's delivered. So I think that this is, this is a great direction, um, even though, yeah, we, um, I'm a bit sad that we're losing W League as a brand. Yeah, fair point. Eric, I'm sure you've got some opinions. Um, it does remain to be seen how it works out in practice. A League women is a bit clunky, but hey, there's always a AL dub, so I hope that becomes common. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think Madge is right. It's it's more about the details than about th- things on the surface, such as the name, as important as the name is. Yeah, it, it does feel a little bit. Um, Malibu Stacy has a new hat, um, <laughs> but. Uh, I, like, I think the point that Madge makes is, is an interesting one around the semantics of, of the, like the A league being the men's league as the W league, like obviously the A was for Australia and W is for women, but like it, there's that obvious distinction of the A being the best, being the top of the class and W being obviously like attacked on women's competition. I, I like the kind of synergy that you have around, um, a, uh, the A leagues and, uh, men and women as you say though it will be interesting to see how kind of media organizations update their style guides in ref- in referring to these um and a conversation that uh, eric and i and, and a bunch of others had had off uh mike was around the branding on kits because like uh a leagues the melbourne city jerseys have been released and they have the a leagues logo on them but if you look at the canberra women's jerseys um they have a league a league's women's which i think is really interesting um because the point that i was actually trying to make in this conversation was that it will mean that there won't be any men's and women's jerseys anymore they'll just be jerseys that fit men and women as opposed to having uh like different potentially if you if you have the same sponsorship across the club um you'll have men's fit and women's fit as opposed to men's jerseys and women's Mm -hmm. jerseys um because like the w league jerseys for example for sydney aren't sold in men's sizes, which was a conversation that was had specifically around the last World Cup with Matilda's jerseys, for example. Um, but it will be, as I said, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out in practice with the visual branding on the kits, visual branding around the grounds um, in terms of, say, for example, your A-League dub membership. Will you get a different membership? Will it say only applicable, only applicable to women's? I, I don't know how that will work, but again, that's something that will be 
kind of uh, that'll come out in the wash. Um, but I mean, from a from a kind of perspective, of it, it re- it's really kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. I'd rather the players be paid a living wage than worry about what we're calling the league at this point. Cool. Thank you for that. And and I do think you're quite right when you talk about the, it should be one kit, but the sponsors do vary. I think that's mm, what we've seen. Course. So yeah. they will probably continue to maintain those couple of kits. For me, my, my own personal opinion is that it feels a bit squished and it feels like maybe at least from the outside, it felt a bit rushed. Like I'm not sure how much they consulted with other groups to see. I'm not sure how much they looked around Australia and, the A-League to me for from today and, and quite possibly for a long time will still feel like the men's game mm. because they're, you know, they've just squished us into that. They've not given it a new identity. I don't think calling it A-League women is enough of a change to an identity. So, yeah. but over the years, new people who watch the game will never even know that this happened. And I absolutely agree that it's, it's about the, the real details that matter I just think that if this demonstrates what those details as well, have they gone through and done everything that they needed to do? Mm. Proof will be when they start playing the game. It really interesting thing when we talk about the details, and I'm not sure, Eric, if you were, um, did I write that in the show notes or, or did you write that in the show notes just about the change to the W to the Twitter account? Yes. So, Going to be, going to be a bit, con- uh, potentially a bit confusing. They changed their Twitter handle to mm. uh, on the announcement, and then somebody immediately swooped in and took the W. Someone handle. who will remain nameless for legal reasons. <laughs> Was it the <laughs> Chiba then- guy? Mm. Well, I mean, we could be in we could be in legal hot water if we reveal these this information. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's very funny whenever you see that. It was the same when uh, when Tamiki Yallop changed her Twitter handle. And um, a friend of friend of mine and a friend of uh, the, the Far Post Pod took the Tamika Yallop Twitter handle, um, and then she just had to kind of make do with whatever she could get. Uh, but yeah, it is funny that they've kind of been like, "Oh, we forgot to secure the old Twitter handle." Oops. And, <laughs> and that's a detail, right? That's what I'm talking yeah. about. These these are the details that we need to be thinking about when we're making these mm. decisions. And we have we um have we thought it all through? And I'm not saying anything negative about APL. I'm just saying it remains to be seen for me how successful this will be. But I absolutely yeah. agree that seeing these as, you know, it's just football is really important. So you know, Agreed. hats off. Let's see where it takes us. Let's jump on to more news of the week. And this is probably not the good stuff. And we, you know, the podcast I like to think talks about the good things in football, but I don't mm-hmm. think we can necessarily turn a blind eye to what's been happening in the NWSL. And I say in the NWSL because that's the news that's out at the moment, but it doesn't seem to be, you know, just in the NWSL that we see this kind of stuff. Madge, I'll throw back to you to make sure that you get plenty of time on the podcast to voice your opinions as well. But do you want to give us uh, your overview of what it is that's happened? If anyone's been living under a rock, Madge is going to give you a little bit of an update of what, what it's all about and your thoughts on it as well. Yeah, well, so there was um, the Atlantic article um, that came out sort of detailing, you know, some pretty, uh, you know, grave allegations against um, uh, Paul Riley. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting Megan Shim and I'm forgetting the other player's name off the top of my head um, about, you know, just, yeah, sexual misconduct um, between coach and players. Um yeah, it's 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 really disappointing, and and it's it's I guess how I reflect on it is, I think it ref, reflecting on sport and sporting culture more broadly. We've got this. Um, I think sometimes sport feels like it, it it can operate outside of the norms of of what a normal workplace operates as, uh, and this sort of winning at all cost mentality or, or the coach, the coaches as king sort of um, mentality that we sometimes see come across in sport can really manifest some really poor behaviour. And then I think when you see in semi, semi-professional uh, leagues, especially, so when you're looking at women's sport that maybe hasn't had the strong governance and structures behind it uh, as it's been growing, uh, 
you can see this sort of behaviour, it, it can be, it just become a hotbed for uh, really toxic and, and, and abhorrent behaviour. Yep, yep, agree. And we are very fortunate, I think, on this podcast that we have the male allies that we do in Eric and Dale and Stefan and all the other guys that work together with us behind the scenes as well. Really interested in, in your thoughts and opinions as well, Eric and Dale. Um, just, I think this has been raised by many people, but just after, after everything that has been alleged and indeed after he, Paul Riley was let go at Port, Portland, uh, why was he allowed to then go to Western New York flash who later of course became North Carolina courage. There was, um, a good thread I saw from the guardian writer, Susie rack in regards to, uh, Lisa Baird, who's, well, this is one of the other things to unpack because two women have been let go, but none of the men, no men as of yet, but she was bringing it. Uh, Susie Rack made the very valid point that um, her, she had, she has uh, Lisa Baird as more in common with the well-off men running things than the majority of women soccer players. And they ba- basically saying, well, we can't, it was great. Good to have a woman there, but you can't just overlook the politics and a background of the people in charge as well. Yeah, the question shouldn't be why was a woman let go? It should be why are the men that were also in charge when these things were happening still there? Yes. And I think that's a valid point surrounding, especially around Lisa Baird, but uh, the kind of conversation that's happening with the Portland Thorns at the moment and, and Timbers for that matter around uh, the, the governance that was in, in charge then and is still in charge now. Um, around what was happening while he was at Port- while while Riley was at Portland and and the way that it was so poorly handled, it is it is interesting to me as well um, that these kind of allegations stem from a period kind of centre around a period prior to uh, a, un- a players union uh, in mm-hmm. the NWSL. Um, from what I understand, this was around kind of 2014, 2015, 16, and the union was created in May of 2017. So it is, as I said, it is interesting that that that's kind of the case, and that's uh, that kind of unionization of the players is, is obviously very uh, common in American sport and very common in professional football. Um, but we're kind of looking back, um, kind of looking back on it now and, and wondering, oh, well, you know, why weren't the players protected? And I think that, as you say, that that level of power imbalance and, and that kind of uh, relationship that was uh, unfortunately uh, not kind of squashed um, in in these cases, was was allowed to flourish. Is, as I said, just because of that power imbalance, like the the Thorns were a, a successful successful while right, during Riley's tenure, and obviously it wasn't like fans weren't made aware and supporters weren't made aware of his the reason of his non renewal uh, when he was let go, and and obviously that's kind of disappointing uh, as a Portland fan. But hopefully, you know. That, that comes it's not necessarily about heads rolling obviously you, you would like to see some change made but like you know i think just more information needs to come out of this but you have to you kind of have to tip your hat to obviously the the three players involved um as well as alex morgan and and also the two journalists that broke this story because like there were several points in this story reading it where i just thought this can't get any worse and then it did which was really not fun um pretty tough read um, but yeah, nothing compared to obviously what the players are going through, and, and it's really, really good. I must say, I must say, obviously, Paul, as I said, as a Portland fan, it's been really positive to see the amount of support that the players, in, both in the NWSL uh, and uh, kind of in their team in Portland and, and also around the league, are getting. They cancelled the games this week, but like the Riveters were out protesting it at um, Portland Stadium. So you know, um, more power to the supporters who who are backing the players as well. Yeah, but on that point about this of the immature structures, so like the um, the union only more recently uh, developing, uh, I think it was Megan Klingen- Klingenberg in um, Steph Yang's piece was talking about how the players, you know, there's also this cultural pressure about the players wanting to do everything that they can to promote and grow the league. And, uh, you know, creating controversies or, 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 or bringing up issues of, of abuses of power mm. is, it was something that, you know, that could, could be seen as really difficult. And then when you don't have great governance structures to, to help and, and create good culture, um, this is where you get, yeah, just horrible abuses of power happening. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's I think, good. Uh, and, good. Go on, sorry. 
I was going to say good points from from all of you and Dale, just where you were talking about the the union, and I was thinking about the players' association. I, I love to think that. In Australia, we wouldn't see anything like that, but I am not. I, I tend to be naive, I will say that, but mm. I don't think that I'm that naive that we haven't seen that and we won't see that going forward. But I, I, if there's anything good to come out of this, I wonder if it is that it is a bit of a me too moment and it is also demonstrating that the players do have some power and they can they can make it, push it out there, push that news out there or not news, but push that information out there so that people really see what's happening. Look, it's not just Paul Riley as well. It is allegedly, sorry. There are also, I, I think, were there three other coaches who were let go from their positions with the NWSL in just this season? So, you know, there's yeah. a lot of money in football. It's a big game. It's it's not just the NWSL. It's it's all over the shop. But I do hope that if there's anything that comes out of that, that it's more visibility and more ears listening to it. Some, some of the big news outlets are copping a bit of flack saying, well, the only time you care about women's football is when there's something like this coming out of it. But the good thing about them writing about this sort of stuff, it's, it's getting more visibility. People are reading it and saying, that's not on, that's not okay. Mm. Like I want them to write about football all the time and to write those positive stories as well. But if they're getting the reach from this, then people are going to learn from that and say, oh, you know, that's that's a bit dodgy. We, How do we stop it? That's that's the goal. How do we stop it from happening? And I really like um, some of the things that Eric posts on his Instagram page. Uh, uh, Eric, I don't know if I'm going to paraphrase this very well, but it was how do we stop rape from happening? And there were six mm six tips about how you stop it if and this is essentially if you're kind of like the guy um one of them is a mm. buddy system like take a guy with mm. you if you feel like you're going to rape someone take a guy with you and get him to help you stop like you know the we need to work out well what are the strategies that are going to put these players in a safe space what are the strategies that are going to stop these people in power doing these things but anyway it's it's a very uncomfortable topic it's very hard to see what the players have to go through to be part of that. So, yeah, very difficult conversation. Any final thoughts on that before we push on to hopefully nicer things in our discussion piece today? I just want to say I hope the um, APL and Football Australia then are looking at their own policies mm. to see if there's, with regards to this, to protection of players, to see if there's anything that could be improved. Yep. Agreed. Because really as you point. say, I mean, as, All right. as, as uh, said. let's have a look now um, just to signings. So we've got some W League signings. Eric, do you want to take this one away for us as well? I just have to run through the last week as brief as I can in terms of oh, what I can remember. Adelaide have cast a wide net. So Natasha Broff, who was most recently playing in the Netherlands and has spent almost a decade in Spain, I think, judging by her own website. So, But she is Australian, so she'll be coming home. Riona Omiya from South Melbourne, NPL Victoria, and a player Madge will probably be familiar with, uh, former junior Matilda Georgia Beaumont from most recently of uh, Morton Bay United. So that was Adelaide. Brisbane, we've mentioned, spoken about Cannon Clough, also signed Lani McDougall from Morton Bay United. Canberra have done their now customary three signings in a week, and I believe there's going to be three more this week. So um, Holly Casper is from Sydney University. Margot Rabin, the French woman who was Melbourne City last W League season, and Chloe Middleton, whose uh, last W League season was with Western Sydney Wanderers. Melbourne's, Melbourne City, I don't... Oh, Letitia McKenna. So that's, um, that's the big... I really like watching Letitia McKenna play uh, both Brisbane and in NPL New South Wales with Spartans early this year. So that's both a good get for Melbourne City and a, a bit somewhat of a loss for Brisbane. Uh, Melbourne Victory uh, decided to rickroll all of us with Courtney Nevin. If you see see the Instagram post, someone just wanted to play Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley and decided the Courtney Nevin signing was as good as an excuse as anyone. So good on them. Uh, Newcastle still stuck on 12 signings. Hope they don't do what they did last season and do a massive dump on signings on a Friday night. Um, and I think that's it. Sydney are pretty much set. Perth have 22 players, but apparently there's more coming. I've heard rumors of that. I don't know how that'll work. Wellington are supposed to be signing, announcing a coach and players very soon. 
And then uh, and finally, a uh, great pickup by the Wanderers getting uh, Kiwi International Malia Steinmetz, who was with Perth Glory last season. I think that's that's pretty much the right weekend. W- so, yes, a wonderful signing. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for that. Anyone who, um, Madge, anyone who particularly interests you or if you're um, watching the Brisbane or the Queensland NPLW, are there more players that you expect to be picked up pretty soon? Oh, yeah, there's a few more. Um, Brisbane needs some defenders, uh, especially now that we've unfortunately lost Holly McQueen. We've got basically Cannon and and Jamila sort of in there at the moment. So, um, yeah, we're with friends. We've been going around. Who who do we think could get um, could get promoted in that in that space? Um, and there's a couple of young players. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if an Ellen Get might get um, a contract um, this season. So. We'll see. All right. So cool. she, yeah, she's playing for the QAS at the moment. <laughs> Very good. Let's start going around the world. It's it's almost, um, well, we're more than halfway through the podcast, so we better get cracking. Um, not great news coming out of the WE League for Alex Chidiak in that they lost 3-0 to Bletsa. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, but that, I always preface my international pronunciation by saying, don't know if I said that right. One of the um, longest team names in world football. Oh, I Nippon want to look this up now. Television, Tokyo Verdi, Boletsa. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah, I just went with Boletsa. But anyway, um, so that puts Jeff Chiba 11th, I think, on the ladder. And they started off with a draw. I think they've now had a couple of losses. So we'll see how they go. Who wants to give us our UK update? I've only watched two of the mini games, but I, I know that Madge ran through a game this morning as well. So we'll make sure we give you some space for her. I think it was Man City and West Ham that you wanted to give oh, an update please on. Give us, please give us your yeah. take yes, on Man please. City West Ham, Madge. Well, yes, I had please. it on this morning as I was, as I was brewing some coffee and and um, my, my main comment was um, Alana Kennedy isn't alone in the um, back pass to the keeper club conceding a goal anymore. So Demi Stokes um, right at the death. Uh, but I think West Ham played great. Um, yeah, mm. and Macca was amazing, the, you know, pulling off seven saves, I think, and, and the clean sheet. So it was, um, and Tamika had, you know, a couple of good opportunities. Um, one that went straight at the keeper. I think she had a, a good glancing header opportunity as well there. Uh, but Man City, I mean, they definitely had their chances. So hit the wood, woodwork, and I think um, Kemp just missed an opportunity for a, for a tap in. But um, yeah, so it was a great game. So yeah. no Alana Mets. Kennedy and no Haley Razzo yet. No, Correct. Yeah. Kennedy was on the bench, and but Razzo wasn't wasn't listed. Uh, they did have a cup game this week, though, if I remember correctly. So they did, it would yeah. kind of make sense that they would be rotating the squad. So, um, yeah, City looked like they could have been there for a week um, mm. and they wouldn't have scored. They were they were shocking in front of goal. Yeah. Um, but very good to watch. Uh, we do like watching Man City lose <laughs> because it makes things interesting. Yes. Uh, I'll do a quick whip around the grounds. Uh, so, first game of the weekend was the uh, was Chelsea one. Uh, sorry, Chelsea three, Brighton and Hove Albion one. Uh, Sam Kerr on the score sheet at the end of the first half for that one. Uh, Daniel Carter's goal, sneaky good. Really enjoyed that. Uh, just kind of controls the ball down to her feet, and instead of just like blasting on goal, just tucks the ball with the top of like with her laces into the bottom corner, which is really sweet. Uh, Chelsea. Obviously, they're kind of running away with it at this point, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, speaking Sammy of running bit, away with it. Was Sammy a little bit um, off? Well, because she, she only scored once. No, she was great. She, she was, was I don't, I, Yeah. I don't think she was off. She had one opportunity at the start of the first half mm-hmm. that she probably should have taken, um, where she was just at the back stick and she didn't p- poke a foot out. Um, but, like, she created a lot and, and she she did a lot of work off the ball. She did look, a, I mean, a little frustrated, but also she wants to score 40 goals every game. So, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the kind of path of the course. She was running around smiling an awful lot, which I, I thought was good and good to see her. I just thought maybe mm. she's excited that they get to come home to Australia pretty soon. But, yeah, I, I thought there were a couple of chances there that I'd like to see them finish considering that we're going to come up against Brazil. Any chance that we get, hopefully we put it in there. But anyway, yeah. keep going. Talk more football. Aston Villa. Uh, Aston Villa nil, Arsenal four. Uh, Mana Iwabuchi trying to hug um, players that are like her goal was fantastic, but 
all about little players hugging big players. Uh, more on that later. Uh, no Emily Gilnick on the team sheet for Villa, um, which is a bit of a bummer. But again, there they were likely uh, cup games uh, to play. Uh, Caitlin Ford and uh, Steph Catley did get a run for the Arsenal. Um, Catley in a really kind of weird, like midfield y, left wingy position, um, which was really good. Um, sartorial note, huge fan of the Arsenal away kit. Um, really like that kind of like pastel yellow that they have. Uh, no appearance for Lydia Williams, though, unfortunately. Uh, that was also at Villa Park, which is really, really cool to see. Villa Park used to be one of the grounds that used to host. Uh, men's FA Cup semifinals um, before the semifinals were moved uh, whole and sold to Wembley. And it's, a, it's I think it's the third or fourth biggest ground in, in England. So really cool to see uh, Villa taking a women's game there. Um, speaking of teams in Claret and Blue, Man City nil, West Ham two. We mentioned that one. Um, this Dagny Brindner's daughter with the goal uh, in the first half and then um, really this this was the tall and small. Uh, Yui Hasegawa trying to give her a cuddle when she's like a foot and a half shorter than her. It was really sweet. Uh, and then Hasegawa with a goal in injury time, um, chipping the Man City goalkeeper, which, as I said, we love to see. Uh, the yeah, a couple of t- those. Um, that's what the uh, the that West Ham goal was as well. Sort of chipping yeah. yeah, loved and I mean, like, you're really on a hiding to nothing. Um, we don't want to see like karmas on karmas crime like we did in the dub of those years ago. Um, so you know, sometimes if you're a goalkeeper in that situation, you just got to kind of take your L and deal with it. Um, they, you know, it doesn't matter if you lose two one nil or two nil, really. Uh, speaking of two nil, Leicester nil, Spurs two. Uh, that was. Uh, I'm just bringing that up. I actually haven't watched this game. So uh, goals for Angela Addison and Rachel Williams in that one. Uh, any f- Australians in that? No, uh, Kai Simon wasn't on the Spurs team sheet. Rhea Percival as well? Uh, no? Do it. Disappointing. Go away, Optus. Very frustrating. Uh, Everton 3, Reading 0 at the Medeski Stadium. No, I will not be using its commercial name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Goals to Anna Anvergaard. Uh, I think it was Danielle Turner and everybody's favourite Melbourne City player, or former Melbourne City player, uh, Claire Elmsley, or Emsley in that game. And that was that game. And then there should have been one more game of the round. Birmingham, Manchester United. Yeah, Birmingham, Man, Man United. So Birmingham nil, Man United two. Uh, just bringing that one up for you all now. Goals to Leah Galton and Ella Toon. Shock horror, Ella Toon scoring goals. Uh, Birmingham, yeah, just look, not not having a great odd season, Birmingham, unfortunately. Um, I feel like they play at a... They do. They play at Walsall. Oh, no, they're, they're playing, playing at St. Andrews this season, sorry. Um, so that's yeah. uh, that's this week in the FAWSL. Uh, Arsenal on top uh, alongside Tottenham, who have a significantly lower goal difference, mm-hmm. uh, and Chelsea and Man United in third and fourth. Bottom of the table, Reading, Birmingham City, Leicester City, all on zero points after four rounds. And then, much to everybody's sadness, Manchester City fourth from the bottom. And that's this week in the FAWSL. Thank you very much for that. We've just got Stefan joining us, but we're going to keep on giving some quick updates from around the world. So in particular in the Scottish WPL, where we've got two Aussies playing there, we've got Jacinta Galabatarachichi playing for Celtic and, and then for Glasgow City, we've got Aoife Colville. The good news for Aoife Colville is that as much as there were three matches that I don't think I've had a chance to chat about, Aoife scored one match uh, one goal on match day four, which I think was midweek, where Glasgow City won 3-1 against Hamilton. And then just over the weekend, it was a 9-0 victory for Glasgow City over the Spartans with Aoife Colville scoring a brace. So she's not in my queen of the week, but maybe on calling that back, maybe she should be. Uh, Galabatarachichi managed to get some game time, I think, in the second half. Quickly around Europe in France, we had Ellie Carpenter's Leon defeated 
Bordeaux four nil, and that's where I said that Amel Marjory has unfortunately seemed to have ruptured her ACL, so it's not good news for the French international. For Montpellier, they lost one two to Fleury, which is Emma Checker's old team, but Mary Fowler did manage to come off the bench yet again. Super sub goal scored in the ninety fourth minute in Italy. Ella Mastro Antonio's Lazio went down to first placed Sassulio. I don't know if I'm getting these things right on you, Ella, for being out there. And Ivy Lewick did make an appearance for Pomigliano. They were defeated by Inter, sorry, they defeated International um, 2 1. Then in the Netherlands, PSV for Amy Harrison, they lost 1 0 to Den Haag, but Amy was not listed on the team sheet. And now it's all yours, Stefan. Hi, everyone. Hi, Magella. Nice to hear your thoughts today. Yep. Nice to meet you. Um, in the Nordic leagues, uh, there are three three leagues that are still going, and with the flipping of the rounds in Denmark, where all the three leagues are now on, on, the, uh, on the run home towards completion. Um, just for everyone out there, with the... Um, with the, the Norwegian NM um, semi-finals and the final coming up, uh, we did some investigation on how to watch those games, um, and also in the Denmark League after after a question. So um, we've done some updates to our Aussies Abroad page. So there's some other details there about how to watch those those leagues, um, which are, which may help some people. Um, but quickly in Norway, there was no um, top Syrian round this week. There was a catch-up game for Nicola Orgel's clip um, from, from last round, from round 13, and they unfortunately had a 1-0 away loss. And Nicola, again, was was not on the card, so still hasn't recovered from uh, from her injury back in July. Um, but the other big news is that uh, I think I mentioned last week that um, – Carly Rosbacken's um, Lillstrom team had a big seven days coming up. And last week they um, they went down to Valeringa in the league and uh, in the quest for a top two push. And on the weekend, they played their NM Cup semi-final against the top Syrian leader, Sandviken, and managed to watch that game. Um, they went down 2-0, unfortunately. They conceded two goals, two-headed goals in the first half. And they were, they were well taken by... Sandviken, who were dominating in possession at that time. And similar to last week, LSK came back really strongly in the second half and looked really good, but were unable to translate the pressure into goals. And um, unfortunately for both of those games, they, they've lost a trio of players who they were hoping to come back, including Carly being one of them. But unfortunately, none of them were able to, to make it back for these two games. So they can't be far off, but um, yeah, they've missed out on, on a big week for the LSK team. In, in Norway, so we'll see what happens next week. So that's uh, that's Norway. So over to Sweden. It was round eighteen of twenty-two. Big game between uh, the top two teams, um, uh, Rosengard and uh, BK Hecken. Um, so that ended up in a two-nil win to, to the second-placed Hecken, which was uh, a surprise. And um, maybe it'll it'll um, Give Rosengard a, a little bit of reevaluation for the uh, for the finals coming up for the for the, for the ride home, um, but yeah, solid solid win at home to to Hecken. Um, Tegan Micah started and played for Rosengard. Uh, Charlie Grant didn't see any game time, and neither did Dylan Holmes for BK Hecken. And that result closes the gap at the top of the ladder to three points. So it's getting a bit spicy with four games to go up, up the top there. Big gap between um, from the, those two back to the other teams, though. Um, over in Hammerby, Elise Kellen Knights, uh, fifth place team. They had a one-all draw um, just just overnight against tenth place Patea, so they probably would have liked to have done better, I think, in that one. And of course, KK is still recovering from her surgery to a knee, so it wasn't on the card for that. Um, Polk's Claire Pogginghorn had a, had a fantastic game, uh, three 0 win. Um, at home against a team that was around them on the on the ladder, um, Lynn Kerpings. Um, so that's a really good result for them, and that allows them to jump over Lynn Kerpings into sixth spot. And Polk's played the full 90 minutes, so again, going well there. And finally, um, over at um, Vexio, where Winona Heatley is playing, um, and they're the bottom side, bottom um, team on the ladder, but had showed some signs lately of... Um, putting in some good results and, and pressing some of the more fancy teams. 
they played the team that was one above them on the ladder. So I would have been hoping on the back of some of that better form to do well, but they ended up with a one nil away loss. So and Winnie, uh, sorry, Winnie was on the card, but didn't see see any game time for that game. And finally, over in Denmark. Um, so with the flipping of the rounds last week, we saw Fortuna have a two-all draw with um, HB Kirk. And this week, uh, they got to play them again. Um, it's quite a different game for Fortuna. They, um, they had settled into quite a, um, a regular-looking formation, uh, which included usually Angie Bid playing at left-back and Claire Wheeler starting as well in the midfield, centre of midfield. But this week, Angie Bid played wide as an attacking left midfielder. Um, so a different position for her. Um, Claire Wheeler was on the bench, so I'm not sure if she's got a niggle or something, but um, she didn't get on the on the field this week. And there was a debut for Alex Alex Wynn, so um, that was really good news for her. She'd been coming back from, from an injury as well, and um, so very, very pleasing for her that she got her first game time for the club. Um, played most of the first half. And also Indy Riley, who has been playing half an hour in the second half lately, got a rare start um, for, for the team and played half the game. Um, so that was a 4-0 away loss. So I'm not sure they'll be sticking with those changes, um, but I guess we'll see next next week uh, when, when they round, um, go out for their round nine game. And also Jenna McCormick with, uh, with AGF. AGF had a 1-0 home loss against North Zealand, again, with the flipping of the round. Um, and this result sees them drop to seventh place. So they're also heading towards the relegation zone or in the relegation zone. So we'll want to try and um, dig their way out of that in the next few rounds. Jenna played 90 minutes. And the big news is next weekend, both those teams are playing each other. So it'll be, uh, it'll be uh, fascinating to see how that goes. So... And that's it from the Nordic Leagues. Thank you very much, Stefan. It'll be interesting. I did see on Jen Wilmot's uh, social media that they're heading to Denmark, I think, to watch some football, to watch the Aussies over there. So if Jen's there, it might be that uh, Anne, over, Anne Odong is over there. If Anne Odong was mm. there, it might be that Tony G is over there. It might be that they're just watching the Matildas over there before they grab them all and run back to Australia, which is coming up pretty soon. Coin to the on week. The- I was going to, just going to say on the on the on the matter of uh, p- friends of the pod who have been playing in Iceland recently. Uh, Emma Checker is currently training with Reading in the FAW. So yes, I saw that. Uh, and everybody's favourite player, uh, Aiden Keane, was at the Ireland game. So uh, maybe she'll be training in a you know lower league down there as well. Who knows? Who yeah. knows? Um, but yeah, uh, I. Sorry, sorry, Shez. Sure. Look at look at Dale just throwing in these little ran, random, you know, bits and pieces. Dale, give us your queen or queens of the week, if you don't mind. Uh, Mackenzie Arnold, that is all. Uh, seven saves, clean sheet. Um, I mean, you know, there's a saying in football that you can only beat what's put in front of you. Um, and I know that Man City are a weaker team, but, you know, we should really be congratulating <laughs> Mackenzie Arnold on such a great performance. Um, I must say though, uh, questions around Man City this season, um, not necessarily anything to do with, uh, the playing stock. They've got some very good players there. Uh, but there, I think, I think there's a few questions that need to be asked that I think they've been kept scoreless in their, uh, three of their last six games. Uh, they beat up on Everton and beat up on Leicester. Um, and they got kept scoreless by Real Madrid and Arsenal. So yeah. Three, three donkeys, uh, three duck eggs for, uh, or donkey's eggs. That's quite a visual image um, for Man City recently. Uh, but yeah, Macca, Queen of the Week for me, for sure. Yep, yep. Uh, Stefan, Madge, I'm deliberately giving you some more time to think about the three to five that you're picking out. Uh, you might be picking a whole squad of 11, I'm not sure. But Stefan, your Queen or Queens of the Week. Yeah, before I go into mine, there was a couple of big uh, signing uh, announcements by Canberra Olympic this week. So uh, eyes are on Canberra Olympic for for what they're doing in 2022. They signed Cecilia Matic from Canberra, Croatia, and also very talented uh, midfielder from Gungahlin, Elka Itolo. So uh, yeah, really uh, working towards something pretty cool over there. But uh, Queens of the Week, um, I had the pleasure this morning of chatting with the, the co-founders of the South Canberra Bees. Um, Kat, you wow, are... you must have been buzzing, Stefan. I was. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> There's a pun for you right there, Madge. <laughs> um, 
So yes, it was a really, really good chat. And um, in the course of that conversation, and there'll be there'll be an article about uh, a season one ret retrospective for the, for the club coming up in the next week or so. Um, but in the course of that discussion, they mentioned that um, they'd been to the workshops that um, Sally Jean Davis or Shippard, Sally Shippard, uh, runs introducing woodworking skills to women, children, and LGBTQ communities. So a bunch of um, South Canberra bees participated in workshops, in those workshops, and they've handcrafted all their trophies for the club. That's so cool. All, all uh, about ten of them. So they, I don't know about you, you, but that gives me all sorts of uh, warm and fuzzy, nice feelings. So um, warm and buzzy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> warm and buzzy. So uh, Queens of the week, uh, Sally Jean Davis, and the South Canberra bees. I, I must definitely. say, as the as the son of a uh, a woman tradesperson or a tradeswoman, that is very cool. Yeah. Yep, very good. Thanks very much for that, Stefan. And I very much like um, that Sally Jean Shibard got that. That's that's great news. And co-founder and friend of the pod, Sarah Groove, has actually been on one of Sally Shibard's um, courses to go off and make stuff. And mm. interesting little tidbit as well. Maybe I shouldn't be throwing this sort of stuff out there, but Sally was actually the celebrant for Sarah and Angie's wedding mm. as well. I was going to so say, there's... yeah, she's she's a woman with many uh, strings to her bow. Uh, yeah, there's a very, so. very nice tight connection there. So uh, on to you, Eric, your Queens of the Week. Okay, I've got two. Firstly, um, Mana Iwabuchi from Arsenal, who has had a great week. So two weekends ago, she made a defender fall over in the build-up to their fifth goal <laughs> against Man City. I'm protecting that defender's identity. I know exactly who it is. I'm not going to say their name. Then there was an absolutely outrageous nutmeg and goal against Tottenham in the FA Cup. I'm also going to protect that Tottenham defender's identity. Mana basically retired the whole of the Tottenham Hotspur Football Club with this goal. And then she scored last weekend against Aston Villa. And then uh, I have a second queen of the week, this close to all of our hearts, our for former social media manager and a woman who wrote many outstanding articles for us, Samantha Lewis. She finally has a full-time gig. She's got a permanent role with ABC Sport as part of their digital team. So ending, you know, the kind of uncertainty that comes with all the freelancing yeah. gigs that she's done, writing, you know, and, you know, who hasn't she written for? Guardian, ESPN, Optus Sport. So it's, I can't wait to see what the team creates. I think the phrase standing on the shoulders of giants um, applies, given that I succeeded her, you know, partly, partly because she was so good at what she did for us, mostly because she's a lot taller than me. Yeah, I was so, going to yeah. say, she's, she's <laughs> the same height as me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Madge, the floor is yours. Tell us your Queens of the Week. Well, I think I'm going to keep with the, the artistic um, theme that Stefan uh, touched on uh, with Canberra. Uh, I'm going to go with um, Sarah Scully and Kim Walmsley, who've done a wonderful mural at the QAS he uh, headquarters at Meakin Park that's just been... Uh, presented or, or you know, unveiled this week uh, in commemoration of the 100 years since the first public yeah. women's football game. It's it's fantastic. It, it you know it pays tribute to uh, you know the the trailblazers of, of women's football uh, from you know from the you know the first those first two the the North North Brisbane Reds and the South Brisbane Blues. Uh, through to you know our, our young mini roos players now so it's fantastic so jump on the football australia article and check it out it's great and i think they've got a wallpaper out that you can oh, download nice. yeah, uh, desktop and mobile they've yeah. thought of everything aren't we the geeks any more from you madge or are you just going with that one oh, look, my other look I, I, I did want to give a shout out to the um the qas uh kids last night they um so the bottom of the ladder of the MPLW, uh, I think with, they had seven wins going in and it's, it's the second last round of the of the season, taking on second place um, Capalaba and they came away with a 3-1 win. So nice. it's always great to see see an upset. Capalaba, you know, they had some players missing, I think um, Holly Palmer and... Uh, Have Adam a look at that bit and just say they got oh, a win. You know, there was a fantastic yeah. team goal, a little back heel, a through pass, a fabulous cross and then Ellen Getz just rising and heading it into the goal is fantastic 
All right. Well, I, I like this um, this way that we're working and doing multiple queens of the week. So I'm jumping on board with that. Mine are um, not quite the celebratory kind of queens of the week that you would think of necessarily, but Meg Linehan for being part of the athletic crew who broke the mm-hmm. story of the, um, I don't know if we just call it the Paul Riley thing or, or whatever, but also to Sinead Farrelly and Manashim who were two of the key players who, spoke out against the abuse that they had been subject to as well. So they are my queens of the week. I, I almost think that maybe there should be a joker of the week on, on the guy that was involved in that, but I don't think a joker is quite uh, necessarily appropriate enough. But thank you very much to The Athletic for for your diligence and your hard work to put that story together. It's not easy to put a story like that together because you have to – double check your facts and figures and make sure that Mm. you're telling the right story and and not just listening to the first person that you hear. So it must've taken them quite a while. So shout out to them. Um, I think that's pretty much the end of the pod, but I wanted to just talk about next week a little bit, because I think we've got uh, the women's champions league will be back on. And I wanted to see a show of hands of who's getting up at uh, 2am or whatever time the games are to go and watch them. Dale's emphatically saying yes from I I start a new role tomorrow, so I will be pushing out Zeds at a great rate. <laughs> but I will definitely be catching up on them. Well, I'm looking forward are... to watching Kharkiv and Real Madrid that take each other on from several thousand kilometres away. All right. Well, for those people who aren't going to stay up late at night to watch the matches, we'll make sure that we give you a an overview of them on the next podcast on Monday night when we go live on Facebook. But also you can listen to us at any time you want just by listening to the podcast as well. I'd like to thank very much Madge for joining us on the podcast and to have a gas bag with us because we love talking football and we've loved talking football with you on the call as well. Thank you to Eric, Dale and Stefan as well for your contributions to the pod. Shout out to Raleigh who hopefully is listening to the pod and just uh, practicing some self-care and looking after herself and Matt. And that's it from the gang. Thank you all. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.